Thank you all for coming this afternoon. My name is Mickey Ratch. I'm the Outreach Services Librarian. If you're here for extra credit, there is a sign-in sheet over in that table over there. Right here. Did we not just look at the table? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Over on the table over here. Please do not get up in the middle of the program to sign it. Wait until the program's over when you're leaving, all right, if you haven't already signed it. And just real quick before I introduce our Dean of Library Services. Most of you know from the flyer that went out um, in our high school group, this was included with the email that went out. We did create a LibGuide for this event. We like to create something for you to further your studies in this, gather more information if you're interested, okay? So each tab goes into a section of the talk there are books highlighted that are here in our library if you're interested, as, long, as well as online resources and video clips, okay? Understand that if it is a Galileo resource and you are off campus, it may be asking you for a password, okay? SSU students, you know you have to check your library account to get that password. If you need help with that, see any reference librarian. This part has been added, though a discussion and questions tab, okay? This is a simple Google form. These lib guides are accessible to anyone with internet access. They are not SSU specific. We wanted to give you the opportunity to participate in the discussion. So there are a few questions. And the final one says, if you had a question that was not answered or if a question comes to you after this event is over, you can post your question here Make sure you leave us contact information and we will make sure you get an answer to that question from one or all of our, our panel speakers today, okay? Again, thank you very much for being here. And now, Ms. Mary Jo Fioyan, our Dean of Library Services. Very briefly, I would like to welcome you on behalf of our President, Dr. Cheryl Davenport Dozier. Uh, we are very fortunate to have a president who has the vision and one of her visions was to for us to have a scholar in residence and this is the first scholar in residence program for 2014 and uh, Dr. Otis Johnson is our scholar in residence and he will introduce the other panel members who I know and love. <laughs> Dr. Johnson. Thank you very much. We try to do a major lecture once a semester. So for the 2014-2015 academic year, this is our first lecture. In the past, we have uh, generally uh, had lectures around the social sciences. And because there is an intersection between the social sciences and the natural sciences and the physical sciences, we thought that this would be an excellent way to show how these things uh, can intersect with each other and the impact of both the sciences have on each other, the natural sciences and the social sciences. So for this lecture, we have collaborated with Dr. Dion Hoskins who is our NOAA uh, scholar here and a graduate of Savannah State University, one of the first in the marine biology program, and Ms. Jovan Morris, Dr. Jovan Morris, who is a postdoctoral student here. I think uh, Dr. Hoskins is her mentor, is that correct? So what each one teach one, and, and, and that's the kind of principle that we're going on. It is also very nice to see the director of the Harris Neck Land Trust, uh, David Kelly, and a resident and descendant of the uh, uh, inhabitants of Harris Neck that we're going to talk about, uh, the Reverend uh, Edgar Timmons. So without any further ado, I'd like to present to you uh, Dr. Dion Hoskins. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson, and I'm happy to be here. Um, at this time, as the first speaker, I invite you all to turn off 
your cell phones if you have not already done so. And I say that largely for my own benefit because I'm always the one who forgets. <laughs> so I'm telling you, but I'm reminding myself. I'm really happy to be the first talk uh, in this collaborative lecture in which we're going to look at coastal Georgia from uh, three perspectives. And I hope that you uh, see the integration that we're trying to achieve uh, in this brief presentation. My job in this is to give you a brief primer on the Georgia coast from an, an ecological perspective. So you can insert that in your framework. So most of us know this, that we are residents, we are citizens of the Georgia coast that has 12 subtropical barrier islands that have a wide tidal range. Many of them are undeveloped, like Wausau, Asaba, Black Beard, and Little Tybee. Some have very little development, and some are developed islands. Many of us are familiar with the development on Tybee Island. One of the first of these habitats that I'll mention uh, are our maritime forests. And these are among the most extensive on the Atlantic coast, and they help us maintain barrier island stability. They keep water in the surface water table by storing precipitation. They provide habitat for important and rare species, and they stabilize mineral cycling through the growth and decomposition of the plants that grow there. Where most of us are accustomed to the image that I'm showing you here, this is the Tybee Island Pavilion and <coughs> Tybee Island, which is an example of a beach environment. They are windy, dynamic environments with irregular water currents, and they're pretty difficult habitat for organisms to live on, unless you're out in the water or up in the dune structure, but right at that water break, you're not gonna have too much life there. So we are enamored with beaches. These are the premium part of our environment for some folks. And we try very hard to manage these areas, even though they are not at all static. Um, as you can see in the figure on the left, this shows our uh, shoreline 15,000 years ago to the far right. And you see it's receded quite a bit to the left 3 million years ago. And in between is our current shoreline and where we think it may be um, if, as we experience sea level rise. And the photograph that you see here is the one house that was standing on Galveston Island after Hurricane Ike. And so we build and we manage these places like they're not going to change, but they do change. Um, and one of the ways they change is uh, shown here in this image where you see a barrier island um, on which the north end is eroded by north-south currents. And they move soft sediment from the north landward to the southward ends. So how many of you have heard about the beach renourishment that's going to be happening on Tybee Island soon? Raise your hand. Okay, a few, and one of the people that raised his hand is the mayor of Tybee Island, <laughs> Jason Buterman. Uh, so it is a dynamic of which he's very familiar. That land, that those sediments get moved down to the southern side, they get deposited on the southern side, you have the deposition of fine sediments slightly to the west of that, that fills in with marsh, and that's how our barrier islands move. So even in the absence of a catastrophic weather event, we're gonna have movement on these islands. So this is an example of how natural forces um, change coastal landscapes. The other landscapes that we're familiar with are our coastal marshes, our Spart Spartina alternifora marshes, and they have a three-dimensional structure that provides spawning, nursery, refuge, and foraging grounds for many different fishery species that are important to us, like blue crabs and shrimp and whiting and croaker and spot, the things that I like to eat. <laughs> and they also provide storm protection for our shorelines. And so areas that have depleted their marshes are less resistant to storm events uh, than those that have allowed their uh, coastal areas, their coastal marshes to stay intact. One of the things that coastal landscape structure does is that it provides ecosystem services. I'm going to define that a little bit later. So another characteristic of our Georgia coast is the mixture and, of fresh and ocean water to form our estuaries. These hydrologic characteristics define our tidal marshes, and they also um, shape how our tidal marshes are um, configured. And I'm going to show you this in a minute. So look at the repetition in the natural patterns of our marshes. Here in the upper side, you see a large coastal river, and then coming down perpendicular from it, 
is a smaller tidal creek. And from this tidal creek, branching off to the left, is another smaller tidal creek. And if we focus in on this aerial photo again, we will see that that tidal creek branches off into other smaller tidal creeks. And this occurs at multiple scales. It occurs across our system. It occurs across rivers. It occurs within tidal creeks down to the smallest creeks that you will see behind Savannah State University and Country Club Creek. And through this structure, water brings nutrients into this coastal system. And as the water brings in those nutrients, it increases primary productivity. That is, the productivity of plants that live there. And then that increases the secondary productivity, that biomass of organisms that get big and delicious that we like to eat. So this is the structure of a sub subsystem of a tidal creek. Again, the communication with the inflowing water, the, um, with the tidal currents, and um, branching off. So across all habitats, the maritime forests, the marshes, our beaches, we get fundamental life support processes on which all organisms depend, including ourselves. They produce the ecosystem goods that we need, like the fish, the shrimp, the timber. They generate and maintain biodiversity. <clears throat> they stabilize the climate, and they stabilize the habitat that the life, um, the organisms that live there need. They mitigate the impacts of floods and droughts, and they give us something that is very beautiful, something that is very intellectually stimulating, something that is very spiritually st stimulating. Natural habitats provide for us ecosystem services. So here's an example of the ecosystem services that are provided by a coastal marsh. So in this picture, you see a plume weir, which is basically a big uh, rhomboid or, or a little bit more than square trap that if you open the door, and this was built by Ron Kanai for his research on South Island in 1991. It's a big trap that you build in the middle of the marsh and has nets around it and a wood frame. You open the door at high tide, let all the water come in, then you close the door. You let low tide go out, and so all the organisms that are trapped stay there within the flume weir, and then you can count what was there, what their size is, what their mass is, and get an idea of how much productivity came into that area of the marsh for that particular time. And what you'll see on the y-axis, if you treat the y-axis, which is annual production, if you envision that as the edge, since the, this is, the x-axis is distance, from the edge of the marsh, so this would be water here. Inside the marsh, you have a pretty stable amount of biomass that starts moving towards the edge of the marsh, both for resident species and for migrant species. What this represents is a threshold of carrying capacity that the coastal marsh has in terms of the organisms that it supports. And then it starts to move that energy towards the water's edge. And we're used to that. We know when low tide is present, high tide is present, we fish, we behave, we act differently. Well, if you flip the figure that I just showed you so that the water's edge right here matches this cartoon that I've shown you, then you're seeing this movement of biomass, this movement of productivity going from the marsh out to the water. And this is called the trophic relay. This is a relay of the food and the organic matter and the relationships among the organisms that live in the marsh out to the water's edge. And this occurs by resident species that stay around the marsh and organisms come and eat those, prey upon them. This occurs by way of the species that move in and out, those transient species like shrimp and blue crabs. This occurs when organic matter that's being produced in the marsh via primary production and secondary <coughs> production finds its way into the biomass of the other species that live there and move out into the coastal ocean. This moves marsh production along our coastal landscape and consequently, if you destroy the marsh, you're destroying this chain of productivity. So let's look at an example um, where we saw this demonstrated in a natural environment. In Delaware Bay, there was an area where the public service electric and gas utility um, had to perform a mitigation project for some reason that was in their corporate history. And they chose to open up a dike marsh system that had been closed um, because they were producing salt hay. So what had been done was that there were dike areas um, that needed to be reopened. The areas that didn't have that water communicating, uh, Spartana alterniflora was no longer there, and Phragmites, which was an invasive not 
not best for that area grew up. Fish were not able to get in there, and so they constructed fish ladders, they started doing biological monitoring, and they also opened up areas for folks to enjoy the habitat they were restoring. This 1,000 acres went from what you see in the top figure in 1997, a barren mudflat, to in 10 years, a healthy marsh, mainly because the communication of the tidal creek back to this area brought in nutrients and restored the natural productivity of that area. So this is kind of what I'm talking about in terms of ecosystem services. They restored communication like we see in this area photograph of the hydrologic processes. So this trophic relay does work. What I've shown you in my small section of the talk is that we understand the science and we know the coastal landscape ecology and natural forces that govern the coastal environment and that are part of what we should understand as citizens who live here. And when you're driving past Savannah Mall to I-95 and you're going over the Forest River and you look over to your right and your left and you see the marsh, you're seeing this ecosystem functioning. The same as when you're going over the bridge on Wilmington Island. You're seeing these dynamics in, in action. But there are other factors that affect coastal environments. Mm -hmm. There is the management, applying the science that we use for proper conservation. There are the cultures, the uniqueness of island and coastal environments. And there's also the policy and politics, the consequences of the social political environment that may influence any of these things, <coughs> including the science and how we are citizens in these areas. So, consequently, Georgia's coastal zone is shaped by two major processes. Currents, water currents, which we can use environmental science to understand, and currency, which science can affect sometimes in no way. Thanks. Dr. Javon Morris, who will continue our conversation, and we ask that you hold your questions until all of the speakers have completed. Thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon again. I'm Javon Morris, and today I'm going to be presenting a little bit about the cultural aspects of being coastal citizens here in Georgia, using Harris Neck as a case study. So a little bit of background on Georgia's cultural landscape. You'll see here pictured the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, which extends from Jacksonville, North Carolina, all the way down to Jacksonville, Florida. And this cultural her heritage corridor is unique in that it's home to the Gullah Geechee people of Low <coughs> Country and Sea Islands. And this particular population is the only group of African American people in the United States recognized as a nation as people were brought over to the United States from West Africa, they brought along with them culture and traditional knowledge that of fishing practices and net making, boat building, building, as well as knowledge of how to be stewards of the environment, and specifically with reference to rice cultivation. The history of the Sea Islands is intertwined with considerations of race, ethnicity, and class. After the Civil War, freedmen established tight-knit barrier islands communities along the Gullah Geechee cor uh, Corridor. One of these communities was Harris Neck, which is located in McIntosh County. Currently, you'll see on this map, Harris Neck is a national wildlife refuge. In 1942, over 2,000 acres of land was taken for military use during World War II. In 1962, the Department of Interior converted these lands into a wildlife refuge with considerations for migratory birds and other species in this unique <laughs> ecological system. But for residents of Harris Neck, this place represents something completely different. In context for residents of pe and people who lived in Harris Neck prior to 1942, Harris Neck represented a sense of place, home, and belongingness. It also represented a identity in terms of being African American, but also having retained the, the cultural identity of holding on to that West African traditions. Harris Neck also was home to 
a lot of fishermen in what ties to maritime occupations in terms of fishing, crabbing, oyster, and oyster um, processing. And it also provided income and food for members of the Harris Net community. More recently, Harris Net represents an environmental justice movement to reclaim the lands that were taken during World War II. So how do we move forward to a more comprehensive uh, uh, understanding of the human dimension of these <coughs> issues in terms of uh, negotiating conservation as well as cultural retainment and not impacting or having negative impacts to communities? In my work here at Savannah State, I've been investigating the role of traditional knowledge. Traditional knowledge is an alternative way of knowing those traditions, that knowledge that's passed down from generation to generation, those uh, connections to cultural identity that are sometimes translated or related <coughs> in the literature or on the internet or through traditional sources of information. Local knowledge, as traditional knowledge is sometimes referred to, and cultural memory are crucial for the conservation of bio biodiversity because it serves as a repository for alternative sources of knowing alternative management practices that might have been only understood by living in that particular environment, by learning, by experience. So this is important in keeping the cultural and biological diversity flourishing in communities. Traditional knowledge also has a role in giving voices to communities that might be underserved by history. So one of the limitations of traditional knowledge is reconciling it with what's considered hard science. Uh, this field is, re uh, is relatively recent in terms of gaining interest in implementation in management. It's highly debated in terms of being considered legitimate, valid, or even authentic in terms of uh, identifying experts in local communities who might hold this knowledge. But as hard science scholars, and I know there are a couple a lot of students and researchers in this room, and as professionals, it's important that we understand that our perspective as we move forward in our research is privilege. We don't have to prove that our story is true uh, versus someone who's actually in a community holding this lived experience. That might not be held up in a scientific platform. But traditional knowledge is scientific knowledge. It's not objective and it's not context free but it's just as valid. So moving forward with regard to my data and methods for my work, I spent over six months attending community meetings in Harris Neck, conducting literature searches and stakeholder surveys, as well as conducting oral history interviews with members of the Harris Neck community. These interviews were recorded and transcribed and coded according to several thematic areas, particularly with emphasis on the fishing practices that took place in Harris Net. And just to give you a little bit of insight, there are over 10 hours of audio recorded right now, and for each hour, it takes about four hours to transcribe. So thank you to the students who helped with that. <laughs> so, so far, I've conducted oral histories with nine individuals in Harris Neck, all of whom were African American, using a snowball and gatekeeper recruitment techniques, basically building rapport with the community and gaining access so that when you do do these oral histories, I get accurate information and I get a story that's true um, with regard to the knowledge that's being passed. So starting off, and I'm very, very um, fortunate to have Pastor Timmons actually here, when we conducted our oral history interview. Pastor Simmons shared with me a little bit about his father and his grandfather and their family processing, oyster processing plant on Harris Neck. He spoke about the boats that were used and the jobs that were provided for residents of Harris Neck by this oyster uh, factory. So in terms of coding these interviews, basically listening and re-listening and transcribing, I became very familiar with the information and you were able to extract themes uh, that coincide with the business and economics of fishing and processing in the community. So you were able to see a few quotes about um, his father having 12 boats, 12 community residents picking and uh, females in the oyster factories who had the responsibility of shucking oysters. So you learn a little bit about the gender roles in terms of what 
uh, what men and women, what their responsibilities in processing work. He also spoke about the distribution of these moisturizers throughout the southeastern part of Georgia. Uh, so that goes into selling the catch. So you'll see pic pictured here, um, Tiger Bluff. And I put this quote that says, if you stand up, you should be able to see a cedar tree. And Pastor Timmons was able to use not his physical sight, but his memory to give me an accurate tour of Harris Neck, which is pretty amazing to have lived this experience and after so long be able to go back out and point to where everything is in Harris Neck on the water, by the way. So again, um, you'll see here emphasized one by one they would unload the oysters into a big bin. And women in the factory made a good living during the winter to help sustain family, to help sustain the family financially. So you hear, have here the role of oyster processing and providing earnings and revenue for the community. Again, gender roles. And when he spoke about his grandfather being a great preserver in terms of uh, seeding oysters by taking used oyster shells and placing them out on the bank so that new oysters are propagate. This speaks to the different conservation measures and fishery management practices that were in place even prior to a formal institution of conservation efforts by agencies. So, next I had an opportunity to speak with Mr. Kenneth Dunham, and he spoke about his father's role as a boat builder in the Harris Neck community. So again, you have here uh, information being passed down on different types of gear and fishing technology used in Harris Neck with regard to different types of boats, cast nets, and gill nets that <coughs> were used in terms of providing fish, oysters, and again, crabs for the community as well as for income. And with regard to different social and cultural characteristics, you have here value being placed on the transition of this knowledge from one generation to the next. So he says wherever his father was, that's where he was learning how to uh, do this, learning how to build boats and learning this trading skill. So again, he, his father taught him how to make nets and he was able to, even you can see in the video, he started making a net during our, during our interview. So that was, again, after years, still retaining that knowledge and information that's retaining that cultural uh, identity in this place. So he made the statement that I stayed home and then daddy died in 49 and I was not home very much after that. So that, again, speaks to place detachment, how the family was a strong connection to Harris Neck and what it meant to stay home until your family was no longer there. And even after 1942, to move not too far from where your property was, basically right outside the gate of Harris Neck, just staying close. So you get kind of a sense of what Harris Neck means to the residents. So, um, just the last oral history I'd like to share with you was from Miss Evelyn Greer. And she spoke a lot about the social and cultural characteristics with regard to family and gender roles, whereby boys were socialized to learn how to go fishing, and girls might have had more of an in house responsibilities working with their mothers. But she also spoke that, you know, in terms of education, it might have been informal, where you learn. You got an informal education at home and sometimes had to forego going to school so that you could work at home to help your family. So again, she emphasized that value of learning skills. Education was not just about book learning, it was about learning at home and what you need to do to help your family. So in the next slide, I'd like us to just take a few moments to listen to Miss Evelyn and her story because I don't think I can do it justice. But <coughs> I thank her. God that I'll give. It don't matter with me. I feel like I'm a survivor. I think that one thing I knew that Harris Snake did for me, being me a provider, I can, I can suffer. I can suffer. I can. It threw me out, John, and I can make it because I'll find something out there that I can eat. I will make it. And so, Harris Snake, uh, I, I just love it. I just love that place. Amazing. 
I go to the cemetery to a funeral and I, I was, yeah, down between. Are you going back with us? I'm over on that to get look at all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I wonder sometimes do the government really know the damage they did to us. Mm -hmm. it, they damage us. We, if I could know, we, we survive some. We survive it. I was hurt, baby. Mm -hmm. See your house burned down, your chicken and things, and for nothing. They didn't build a store, they didn't build anything so that we could survive. Nothing. Hatred and, and, and not just meanness. It's just. But thank God. I, I was, a, I think, I think I was a healer, but I think going to church. And my pastor there, they don't know yet today what they did for me. Mm -hmm. I don't hardly know that. They made me who I am, mm -hmm. helped me be who I am, because it wasn't for them. I believe I would grow up just a mean, hateful, hate person. And they taught me how to love through the hate. But it rough on me. It was solid rough. And I, when I look back and saw my home and blame and her crying and trying to hold my mom back so she wouldn't go there trying to get them, I wouldn't wish, I wouldn't wish that on my meanest enemy. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I make myself think about it <coughs> so I know the difference between love and hate. Mm -hmm. Cause that kind of stuff I went through, I could have easily grow up. Growing up right now, like I'm talking to you, I could have been just telling you, calling names of hate. I can't stand them. I can't stand them. I can't stand them white people. I can't stand them. But thank God. So you'll hear her reference Wolf Cemetery, which is located in Harrisnick. But in listening to her oral history, you can also get a sense of the role that religion played in her being able to stay and survive and keep moving forward. But also in referencing her experience, you'll get a, be able to put in the context the role of social stratification and get an idea that this all of these events were taking place during Jim Crow's other politics. So you do get a sense of what it means to uh, experience this and during the, uh, in a different social context of what was going on, not only in Harris Neck, but in the region in general. So what the implications with regard to research, practice, and management, we need to ask ourselves what happens when a story is imposed upon a community. So in my research, I've tried to take a participatory research approach in which members of the community have a role and a say in the way that their story is told. And this, in moving forward, I think it's important that I move forward as a deprofessionalized intellectual in practice because this will help to enhance the validity of these stories through authentic engagement where the stakeholders, community members, they have a say in the way that this research is going and how it's going to be distributed widely. So what knowledge is being distributed to basically outsiders? So again, in terms of management, again, traditional ecological knowledge or traditional knowledge, it's relatively new. So the hard science expectation is that we'll collect data on past and current uses of environmental, um, environmental practices and tools, as well as management systems, and we'll collect data on factual observations. But using traditional knowledge, you can't do this without putting it into context. The reality is that all of this information and knowledge comes with a specific worldview. It comes with culture and identity that's unique to each and every community that you interact with in your research and management practices. And it also comes with a specific set of ethics and values moving forward. So, and moving forward in addressing environmental conflicts, um, 
it's important to move forward with cultural competence. This might help to inform pro uh, proactive approaches that help will, will help to navigate stakeholder interactions and even conflict because perception matters. Whether or not in the injustice in the issue of the Harris Neck, whether it was real or whether it was even perceived, it matters in how we communicate and interact with stakeholders widely, not just in Harris Neck, but in general in terms of being environmental professional. And also stakeholder voice matters. Um, it's important that in building social capital that everyone feels like they have a place at the table and everyone's point of view is being shared. So with regard to maritime professions, having this culturally competent position might help to understand why there are only two uh, crabbers or so few shrimp fishermen uh, um, from Harris Neck or so few African Americans in these fishery positions. So as I move forward and um, allow Dr. Johnson to present his, I just wanted to have uh, this visual, visual of how experience and cultural identity that translate into emotion. And those emotions might translate into individual behavior, which is a segue into social movement. So with that, that is my presentation. And thank you for listening. But I also shameless plug. I have a special topics course on risk, environmental risk communication. So I'm going to be focusing on environmental communications in terms of looking at it, not just from a scientific perspective, but moving forward as environmental managers, being cognizant of the different and so social and cultural perspectives. So thank you. Sitting there as an old man, <laughs> my heart yeah. was just loving. Yeah. Because these two young scholars just give us so much hope. Amen. And when you've been like me uh, in these struggles for so long, uh, sometimes you wonder if the struggle will continue. But I have no doubt in my mind that truly young women, scholars, and the people in this room, that the struggle for justice will continue. Amen. Now, when I was in school and we had two presentations like that, we would say, you know those folk are heavy. <laughs> Amen. And these two scholars are heavy. Heavy. <laughs> now, I'm not going to do justice to them because I can't compete with them. <laughs> and it is not my intention to compete with them. They've got their role to play, and I have my role to play. Yeah. And my role for years has been one of the roles has been as a provocateur to bring up those issues that others will not bring up, to try to champion those causes that people are afraid to champion but they talk about quietly. And so I want to let you know that in 1942 an injustice was done. And that is why I have entitled my part of this presentation, The Politics of the Harris Neck Justice Movement. Because there is a Harris Neck Justice Movement that is trying to correct an injustice that was done to an entire community in 1942. In 1942, in Harris Neck, Georgia, which is located 45 miles from here in McIntosh County, 75 families were dislocated from their homes and thrust out to make it the best way they could. And that's why 
those of us in the movement consider this an injustice. Now, what I want to talk about is the politics of this act that took place in 42 that we're trying to write now. And so, those of you who've heard my lectures before always know that I start off with working definitions of the terms that we will be using so that there's no ambiguity about what I mean when I use the term. So when I use the term politics, I'm referring to the practice and theory of influencing other people on a global, civic, or international level <coughs> more narrowly it refers to the achieving and exercising positions of governance, which is the organized control over a human community, particularly a state. A state just means a governmental unit. So what we're going to be talking about for the next few minutes is the politics of what happened in Harris Day. Now some of us may be ambiguous about what happened. What happened was legal. It may not have been moral, but it was legal because the government has the right of eminent domain. And when in the view of a government, they need land to advance the interests of the government, they have a right to take the land. But also, there is a right or an obligation to compensate the people for that taking. Now in 1942, as Dr. Morris said, You've got to put your mind in the context of the place. Harris Net is in the southern United States, in the state of Georgia, in the county of McIntosh. Now, if you know anything about the history of McIntosh County, in the state of Georgia, in the south, in 1942, you get an idea of the mentality that was going on. This was in the height of the Jim Crow era, where there were lynchings and beatings and burnings, yes, burnings and shootings and all kinds of oppressive measures used against black people. Yes, and here was a thriving, economically viable community on very precious land. Yes, sir. Now that's just a fact. I'm saying it in an emotional way, but that is an objective fact. And so, let's look at what legal means and what moral means. Because the government had the legal right to do what they did. But was it moral? Legal says, allowable, allowable or enforceable by being in conformity with the law of the land. The law of the land are the laws of the United States of America, the state of Georgia, the county of McIntosh, and the public policy. Public policy are the decisions that a legal body make that can be enforced on the public. Therefore, it controls the behavior of the public. And it's not condemned as illegal. But what is moral? Concerning what is right or wrong in human behavior. <clears throat> and there are many times that the government does not do what is morally right. based on what you think is right or good, 
is what is considered moral, <laughs> considered good by most people, which generally means the people in power, agreeing to a standard of right behavior. Let's look at the interest at play. And you see, I don't have the beautiful slides that my predecessors had. I, 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 I'm not that sophisticated yet, but I'm working <laughs> on it. You had the Harris Net community interest. Here was a community established at the end of slavery who really fulfilled the 40 acres and a mule hope that was dashed shortly after Lincoln died. But these people had taken the land, had built a thriving economy, were self-sufficient, and they weren't bothering anybody. They just wanted to be left alone and to have the opportunities that any other citizen of the United States has. The United States government was at war with Germany in 1942. And there was a fair along the East Coast, a just fair, a right fair, that the Germans with their U-boats, submarines, were trying to land saboteurs on the East Coast. They're already devastating the ships out there in the convoys. And if you don't know anything about the Second World War, uh, your history should help you understand that the U-boats were very powerful for a long time at the beginning of the Second World War. And there were rumors, and as a matter of fact, some people were actually caught being landed along the East Coast to come into the United States to wreak havoc. And so the United States said, we need an airfield so that we can patrol this part of the Atlantic to make sure that these submarines don't put these saboteurs <coughs> on land. And of course, the government, the United States government, looked up and down the coast, and they saw where they could establish uh, an airfield <coughs> in this particular area. And a decision was made to target the Harris Net community, although there were alternative communities, that could have been targeted, that were owned by whites. Amen. And I'm not being racist here, I'm just telling you like it is. <laughs> but they chose to go to the state of Georgia, and you know how it trickles down, <laughs> chain of command. They probably went to the state of Georgia and said, we need to build an airfield in this area of your state. And we think that McIntosh County is a good place to build this airfield. So you know what the state did? The state came on down to McIntosh County to the county commission who had control of the county. And they said, the government needs some land down here to build an airfield to protect us from the Germans. And we think it ought to be in this area. Mm -hmm. Now they had a choice. There were no blacks on the county commission, no blacks on the city council in Darien, Brunswick, Savannah, none of that. So the people who made the decision made the decision in their interest. And that's the way power exerts itself. And so a decision was made that we're taking this community because they're not politically powerful. 
They're just a bunch of farmers and fishermen and crabbers and shrimpers and oystermen. So we're not going to get any blowback from this. So the decision was made. Harris Neck is the place we're going to build this area. They came to the community and they told the people, we need your land to build an airfield to protect the United States from the Germans. You know we're in World War II. And the Germans are trying to land these spies. And so we got to protect the East Coast and y'all got to go. Reverend Timmons, how long did they give the folk to get off the land? 48 hours. 48 hours. Pack up everything that you own, that you had accumulated for generations and make your way off the land with no prior preparation for relocation. That's right. Now it might have been legal, but was it moral to do that to an entire community of 75 families? I don't know, and somebody probably does know, how many citizens were in those 75 men. What was the total population of Harris Neck at that time? I do not know. And it's not that important. We know that 75 families were displaced like that with no care or planning for their welfare. Then, after the war was over, and the ironic thing about it is that after they built the airfield, it was really not usable. That's right. The soil was too soft, so the uh, the the, the, um, the uh, runways, you know, really didn't stand up that well. Plus, after they really started decimating the submarine fleet of the Germans, they didn't need to do that much patrolling up and down the coast. The Coast Guard could take care. That would have been the right time to give these people their land back. But they didn't. Because the folk in McIntosh County who had the power probably went to them and said, give us the land. And because Southern Democrats and at that period all of the South was Democratic. Mm -hmm. But they weren't the Democrats that exist today. Mm -hmm. And they had powerful senators and congressmen who those folk in McIntosh County probably worked through to get the transfer of that land from the U.S. government to the McIntosh County government. Yes, sir. Am I telling the truth, Chris? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, all sir. right. We Baptists. Yes, sir. So we know. <laughs> that call and response that go all the way back to home. Yes, sir. There's a book called Praying for Sheetrock that chronicles all of the illegalities that went on in McIntosh County for years and years under certain families and certain sheriffs who was a sheriff and then the son became a sheriff. And so they had control of this land. They allowed white farmers to graze cattle on that land and wouldn't let the people come back Amen. who were the rightful owners of that land. Amen. It is written that there was a house of prostitution on that land. Amen. It is written that that was a, a that little airfield that they could bump these little small planes, brought in drugs into the country mm -hmm. when it was in the hands of the McIntosh County government. Amen. And the federal government found out what was happening and took the land back. But rather than give it to the rightful owners, they put it in the Department of Interior right. under the Fish and Wildlife Service and made it a refuge for birds. Yes, sir. And all the time, these families were petitioning their government to allow them to come back. 
And there's nothing wrong with saving birds, but these people had lived in harmony, as Dr. Morris indicated, for years and years and years. Amen. Because they knew the importance of conservation. Amen. They knew the importance of protecting the natural resources because that was the source of their livelihood. Amen. Amen. So now, I hope you understand these competing interests. Because we're talking about the Harris Neck Justice Movement. We want justice. So what is just? And if I'm going too long, raise your hand in the back. But what is just? Just is agreeing with what is considered morally right or good. Yes, sir. And I got my references down there. <laughs> Treating people in a way that is considered morally right. Amen. Reasonable and proper. So what is justice? What is the thing we want? Of course we want the land back, but that would be an act of justice. Amen. The maintenance or administration of what is just, especially by the impartial adjustment of conflicting claims or the assignment of merited rewards or punishments. There's a conflicting claim now between the birds and the people, mm -hmm. as if they cannot live together. Amen. And we have evidence and proof that they were living together long before these 75 families were thrown off of that land. Amen. And they can live together again. Yes. And so the movement is asking to allow these families the right of return to this land and the right to restore a community that can once again serve the people and serve nature. Now this is one of my favorite things. I, I, I just believe in the dialectical process. And there is a good way to look at this. You have the interest of the Harris Neck community and you have the interest of the government and special interest. Among those special interests are also the environmentalists who, when they are extreme environmentalists, put non-human life in front of human life. Amen. And that's a struggle. And I'm saying that, that those are the extremes now. I'm not talking about the folk in the middle somewhere between, you know, there's a fearful and a, a, a radical environment. But the government and these special interest groups can meet the Harris Net community and they can work something out. Amen. We have asked them to give us 300 acres of land. They've got 2,000, what, 800 acres in the whole thing. Half of that is just marsh and they're prohibitions against using anything on the marsh. So we were asking to give 300 acres to the people. I'm down there struggling and I can't go back because I wasn't an original descendant, but I believe in just causes and that's why I'm there and that's why uh, some other non-family members are there. Thank God for you. So we were asking for justice and there does not have to be the diametrically opposed interests. We can come in the middle and compromise and get something done. Finally, the real question is, the real question is, can we resolve this issue of what is right, what is moral, against what is legal? And as I said in the beginning, the government has done everything legally because it has the power to do it. But, you know, 
when Dr. King was challenging the Vietnam War, they wanted to know, well, why are you messing with this? This is not civil rights. Mm -hmm. Stay on over there in your place and just deal with civil rights. Let us handle this war stuff. But King said, what? An injustice where? Anywhere? It's everywhere. Is an injustice where? Everywhere. All right. So we're involved in this. And we feel very passionately about this. And we want to share this with you because there doesn't have to be, there doesn't have to be any conflict between what's right and what's legal. Thank you. <laughs> yes. And thank you for bringing your class. That, that's outstanding for you to do that. Thanks for hosting. Yeah. What would the objection be to giving 300 acres of the 27 acres? <laughs> I can't think of what I <laughs> Because uh, what we're proposing is to really uh, have a firm buffer between the major area where the wild wildlife is and where the people would be in their uh, newly restored homes. So again, you know, if, if reasonable people want to find a compromise, they can. But it's when we go to the extremes that it makes it difficult. And our Congress right now is a great example of how things become so dysfunctional Amen. when you go to these corners and you don't come to the middle and try to work something reasonably out. Amen. So reasonable people can find a compromise, especially when you can demonstrate that it would have no real negative impact on either parties. Amen. And that's what that's that's our position. So if they want to find a compromise, we can find one. Again, all of the power is in their hands. But it doesn't make it right. Amen. Yes, sir. First, I'd just like to say I like your slides. <laughs> <laughs> it's very simple. <laughs> and how does 300 acres compare to what the family, the 75 families originally owned? Uh, tell them how much the acreage was. The original, there were white owners, none of whom lived there, and then there were community members, all of whom lived there. And the, the acreage that the community owned was about uh, 1,200. So it's already a compromise. Oh, it's a huge compromise. It's a huge compromise. The, the, the movement started asking for all of it back, which, when you start out, that seems reasonable. Because they have no right to take it and not get it back. I don't think anybody would argue over the fact that the government wanted to try to protect citizens of the United States from attack. But the way they did it yeah. was disrespectful. I personally, and, you, and, and, and since I'm retired and I'm volunteering and I'm not on the payroll, I can pretty much <laughs> exercise freedom of speech. Amen. If that had been a white community, there would have been a different outcome. Yes, sir. They would have at least had a relocation plan rather than to give these people 48 hours and say, get off the land, we're going to burn these houses down, clear it out, and build it half I don't believe it. And I guess I'm a victim of my experiences. I don't believe that community would have been treated that way if there had been non-blacks on that land. I don't believe it. There's no evidence 
except for the native people where they did that in such uh, an abrasive way to most communities. Even when they were building the, the dams for the TVA, they gave those people sufficient time to leave that land and relocate before they started building up the reservoirs. So the Native American people and African Americans have been just abused, and that's history. Amen. Yes. Um, you said there's, there's something that they can't find even compromise. Well, what is the government holding back on? Like, why are they refusing? The land well, the land I'm going to tell it like I see it. <laughs> <laughs> we have a regional director of the Fish and Wildlife Service that is adamant that humans should not inhabit this, this refuge. Amen. Now, we've been working, and Rev has been praying that her attitude will be changed. Yeah. And, and, and uh, you've got to, uh, before you go, Chester. All right. <laughs> she is adamant that there will be uh, a conflict, a negative impact of human habitation on that reserve. And she has been in terms of the chain of command, someone that you've got to go through because they respect the chain of command. Mm -hmm. So unless we can get a directive from somebody above her, it's going to be a struggle because of the way she feels. Yeah. And I have to respect that. I don't like it, <laughs> but I'm sure she has her reasons but the science doesn't, the science doesn't back that up. Because every time they throw a, quote, scientific reason, we have been able to counter that. They said that Harris Neck was a maritime forest. We went to a, uh, a, a scientist, had them do a study, and Harris Neck is not a maritime forest. They said that there were are uh, archaeological artifacts all over <laughs> the area, and therefore they had to protect these artifacts. Well, we, we shot that down. I mean, so, you know, reason after reason has been put in the way as an obstacle, and we've been able, through hard work, led by our executive director, Dave Kelly, to shoot down all of those reasons. Now, go ahead. To, to add to that and to address your question, I forgot, I'm not sure who asked it, but we met fortuitously um, in, the, in the path of justice, serendipitously, however you want to look at it. Sally Jewell, who is the head she is the Secretary of Interior. She reports to one person, and that's President Obama. We met with her at the end of June. She came to Harris Neck to announce that the wood stork was taken off the endangered list and being put on the threatened list. And thanks to the mayor and Chester Dunham, who's our board chair, and a few others, we got a meeting with Sally Jewell. Now, Sally Jewell is very, very different from Cindy Donner. Yeah. Cindy Donner has basically said right to us with Miss Evelyn Greer at a table a few years ago, the birds have more rights than you do. Okay, she basically said that. Those aren't the words she used, but that's what she meant. Now, Sally Jewell at her press conference when Obama appointed her this past May, she said to even have a discussion anymore about conservation, preservation, versus development. I don't even want to have that conversation. We need to start from here into the future discussing how we move forward as a nation without saying it's either or. And Harris Neck is a perfect example and our plan is a very conservative and perfect way to move that discussion forward. So I think Sally Jewell 
and because Obama appointed her for a reason, because she is not a bureaucrat, she's never had a government position, she's a former corporate CEO of REI, which is a clothing, outdoor clothing company. So she's a breath of fresh air for us, and I think she's going to be part of the solution. And that's why we have a sense of urgency, because Obama has two more years in office. And generally, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, when the new president comes in, they clean house in terms of their secretaries. And Sally Jew, if, if she's not an exception, will be gone. And right now, you know, she is our hope that we can come to the middle on this thing. Now, you need to ask these ladies. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. You, you got a question for that? Yes, sir. Good. Um, I was actually going to ask about the, um, I guess, the, are there any organisms on the endangered or threatened list, you know, in that area? And you guys just said the Woodstocks. Well, they built it because the Woodstock, <laughs> Woodstock yeah. was on the endangered species. But, she came, uh, the secretary came down in June to announce that the woodstock is no longer on the endangered species. It's on the threatened. So it's getting better. <laughs> I, I would just answer that. that I, I don't have um, in my mind catalog the list of all of the endangered species everywhere, but what I will say is that there is not an endangered species that is relegated just to Harris snake, that Harris snake needs to be preserved for that particular species. There are a number of threatened species that actually are on Fort Stewart. So there are a lot of species in Georgia that are in areas that are not protected that are being um, managed in another way. What I would also offer is that there are a number of reserves. Blackbeard is a reserve. Amen. So there are other reserves in this area that have similar habitats, and in fact, Chatham County has funds that it has put aside to acquire green space areas, and one of the pri one of the priorities that we use, I serve on this commission for Chatham County, one of the priorities that we use is that we go out there and we see if there are any threatened, endangered species, anything of historical, cultural, or archaeological value, or important to future, future sources of water. And so there are lots of areas in this region, because of the conservative way that we have managed Georgia's coast, that there's not an exclusive ecological importance to that one area that necessitates the lack of a compromise as has been put forward. I would just point out on the ecology of it, just to give you the National Wildlife Refuge as much as I cannot talk for them. But <laughs> their perspective is also that the wood stork, the ponds themselves are critical breeding habitat, but they also say that the marsh is critical foraging habitat. So it's not just about the ponds that everybody's trying to protect, but it's also about that. And I would also point to uh, turning your own words on you, <laughs> just to be devil's advocate, that that whole, it's not just about one species, it's about ecosystem-based management, and it's about the entire flow from the edge all the way to the water. Mm -hmm. And so um, to cut off that flow may be what would be against their mission of the wildlife refuge. And so what I would wonder, and I wasn't able to spend as much time with those folks when they visited on campus I would have liked, what I would wonder is what other areas have those combinations of habitats like for, that provide that function. Additionally, there is, um, there's an emphasis on having corridors corridors of habitat, corridors of productivity, such that organisms, you know, organisms don't know that they're supposed to land right here in this chair. They know they're supposed to move into this area based on food and, and temperature and season, those sorts of things. So I understand the idea of Harris Neck fitting within a corridor. I would like to know how that fits with the other protected areas that we see on Little Cumberland, on Cumberland, on Asaba, and on Blackbeard, you know, the, cumul the, the cumulative nature of areas that are available. So I'd like to follow up on that because <laughs> the, speaking about corridors and science, if you just go to Harris Neck and spend some time, 
you can see the actual corridors of flight that the wood stork uses. And it's back and forth between all the ponds. There's six of them. So the disingenuous nature of fish and wildlife, and I won't say that outright lies, but they have said that the wood stork also needs the forest on the extreme eastern portion of Harris Neck, which is where we're proposing a new community. And that is just an absolute untruth. So this is another thing they have thrown up. And they've said, you know, another reason is that there's a particular species of woodpecker that um, lives in Harris Neck, and therefore that's another reason why we can't allow human habitation. Well, we did the science behind that. There's not one of those woodpeckers in Harris Neck. They're in Fort Stewart. So it's just one, as, as the mayor pointed out, it's one thing after another that we've had to raise money for, go get the science, or in some cases, uh, like the archaeological firm sent us a list. Instead of wall-to-wall -wall archaeological sites, there are seven in Harris Neck. One of them is the cemetery. Three of them are in the marsh, which we can't touch. And within the 300 acres that we're proposing for the community, there's one archaeological site. So in some cases, like one of the premier archaeological firms in the United States stepped up and did that study for us for free. Good evening, I'm good, I guess it's afternoon. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. And Doctor, we appreciate, I'm, I appreciate being here today and, and being educated on, um, on what y'all did. And then Dr. Johnson did such a marvelous presentation. My name is Chester Donovan and I'm president of the Harris Bank uh, Wildlife Bank. But I'm gonna just mention a little bit of history what I read and everything else, and it's fact. If you go back to 1865, with the existence of somewhere in there, with the existence of Harris Neck, this theater, wildlife with the resident and the people there was there that whole period of time. It was 19, when did they, the wild, I mean the Fish and Wildlife uh, six was granted. 1962. 62. So all of that period of time, we didn't hear them talk about wildlife or nothing else. Now, the federal government, like you mentioned a few minutes ago, when they took the land, and different ones changed hands, but eventually, the federal government, you know, got the land back. And for some reason, they eventually it, turned it over to Fish and Wildlife. Then that's when they came in with all the different things that we're talking about today. So it's no different. The people live with the wildlife that is in all of that period of time, year in, year out, preserve them, they, everything. The reason that we are asking, we're talking about 300 acres versus the 2,000 or some odd acres because the first time when they try to, you know, for them to try to get the land back. They talk about all of the land because there was no wildlife there. was no, um, fish and wildlife was not there. If fish and wildlife was not was there, they wouldn't be asking for all of the land. There was a reason. The you know, ponds and all of those other things where the wildlife were that whole period of time, that they were there. They wasn't trying to get that land, but that's the reason why we're talking about the 300 acres of land because all of this vast amount of land is just sitting there and been sitting there for years and years and years. Nothing is being done about it. Just that little portion that is shared by the wildlife if you come and you look at it. But all of this other land is just sitting there which is our parents and our people's land was there. And this is the land that we're talking about what the doctor is saying about being fair and legal. Another thing that we're talking about. So, well, that's all the thing. That's just a, a little bit of history that I wanted to give you talking about Harris Neck. If you go into Harris Neck now, on the corridor going down there, you will see a vast amount of land on both sides. And mansions and other people are living <coughs> in those areas going down, leading down into Harris Neck. 
just a few miles away. Or it's right in the same location. So they don't mention about wildlife, where these people are coming and living. Nothing about that. But the only thing they're saying is this other vast amount of land that we are trying to get to put some houses there that, in the sense that we don't want homes and stuff in this particular portion of this land. But just right out of the gate, right out of the road, is where everything's up. The same uh, birds, the same deer, and everything else in that area. So I guess the, 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 the uh, wildlife probably say, well, this area here is for us. <laughs> this area over here is not for us. Because they're circulating all over the place. But they never mention those kind of things. And they, like he's talking about justice. These are the type of things that we have to get people like themselves and everybody else involved to what's going on. And they will, you all will apply pressure on the establishment, on the government and say, make this thing right. And I just want to say those things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Fish, the Fish and Wildlife Service were not the original culprits. They inherited something that was wrong. And the philosophy of a few people in decision-making positions is perpetuating that wrong. So if there's any justice that's going to be done, it will be done either through the Department of Interior coming down through fish and wildlife to the people. Now, we're trying not to get the president involved if we can resolve this without his involvement. But if we can't, then we have to make an appeal directly to the president of the United States. Because in the government of the United States and in the executive branch of the government where Interior sits and Fish and Wildlife is a subset of interior, he can make it happen. But we hope that we won't have to go that far. But we will. We have time for one more question. Can I ask one in the back? I was asked, is three acres even enough for a 75? Oh, yeah. Do you have any idea of, of how much 300 acres? No, I mean, like, like huh? Stand, stand up, young man. But well, that's a good question. I meant like for like wastewater treatment. Oh yeah, um, yeah. We we we've got a we last night we had a meeting, and we adopted a preliminary plan of how we would use begin to use that 300 acres. And I'm gonna let. Uh, uh, they, That's a really good question. It first, is an excellent question. First of all, there are no longer 75 families. Some have just, you know, over the generations have not continued. We've identified 60 something. Each family has a family representative, and they're the voters under the under the umbrella of the Harris Neck Land Trust. But there are only going to be uh, two handfuls or a little bit more families returning. Right now, on our plan. We have a place for 15 houses. And then we have um, an area that's going to be a living museum so you can step back into 1930 Harris Neck. So between the two of those, we're talking about a total, if you want to use the word development, of less than 25 acres. The, the rest of the land we want to keep natural. We want to do some farming. We have a, an innovative sewage treatment um, not sewage, it's a sewage treatment ponds. It was developed by a guy 
who was a scientist for NASA, who spent his life trying to figure out what to do with human waste on really long space flights, like 20 years. So he has developed a system that we're going to put in that is completely natural. And we're going to power the homes and the non-residential area with a, a very small solar field, not even as big as this room. So it's a very small number of families that are going to return. Plus, if someone decides to return, we'll have enough land for them to return. Amen. Thank you. See? But you have to get your foot in the door first. And one of the big things that we have to face is the skepticism about our ability to do what we say we're going to do with the land. So you don't want to go and be greedy and then have that thrown in your face. Amen. You want something that you can get on quickly and prove that all of the struggle was worth it. Thank you all so much. Thank you.